class, let's finally get going with chapter three. On our timeline, we're at 1,000, making our way down to the year zero. Um, and now we're at approximately 1,000 to 400 BCE. The early part of your chapter will give you, um, before you read this chapter, that section, will give you a timeline that's quite useful. And this will be part one of this chapter. It's very uh, exciting because in this chapter, we're going to discuss the, um, excuse me, we're going to discuss the um, origins of democracy. Now we too have a democracy and although it takes its origins, from uh, this particular period in Greece, it's very different. So this is what is called, this complicated word, I don't know if you've heard of it, called an anachronism. Hold on one second. I dropped my notes. Okay. This is what's called an anachronism. We have to be careful of not glomming onto our understanding of the past, what we know today. Um, so it looked quite different, that democracy. And let's, uh, on the other hand, it looked similar in some ways. It was tiny. That's very different. It was only 20, 30,000 men, uh, not women. The slaves did the work in order for the democracy to function. So it's kind of an anachronism, as we say, to look at yesterday and ancient Greece and their democracy as if it were today. So let's let's go. It's exciting. Um, we're introduced to another historian here. Remember, we had Hesiod, who wrote or who talked about history, prehistory, in fact, the eras of global history. We've had Thucydides. We've had others. And this guy's name is Herodotus. He was Greek-speaking. He was part of the Persian Empire. Um, he was from a place called Halicarnassus in what is today Iran. Um, and he, we know, traveled, and that's probably how he learned what he learned about the world around him. Um, what makes him interesting is that he's one way in which we know about... Um, Greek democracy and also the areas around Greece at that time. For example, Ethiopian, India, the Black Sea, etc. I just want to put um, a pin in this gentleman's name, Herodotus. Um, his goal was to remember that the future generations would remember um, man, what he had done, and its great ideas. Um, he was fascinated by Persians, his own people, um, by Greeks, and many other people. Um, let me just say that Greek speakers thought of themselves as different from those other people that Herodotus, Ethiopians, and others, even Persians, uh, who didn't speak Greek, than others. And the word barbarian comes from understanding and observing people who did not speak Greece, Greek rather. They call themselves bar, 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 bar. That was, what is that called? An onomatopoeia where um, the word developed to sound like what it was. And that meant sort of nonsense to the Greeks, barbarians. Um, so the Greeks had a common language. They had a common culture, even if they were from different islands in that area. Um, they were known in different islands to experiment politically, like who's going to be in power, because there were really no kings who was going to be in power um, at any particular time, who was the aristocracy, etc. They also had a strong culture. And needless to say, if you think about it, uh, they made a tremendous contribution to our own civilization, not just in thinking of democracy, but in terms of poetry, thought, and other areas which we will discuss, um, other areas of culture which we'll discuss in this lecture and others. Now, um, the other thing, if you look at your book and you can look at um, 
your book on page 76, you will see, and any of you have ever been to Greece, you will see what is known as the Parthenon. I think most of you have heard of this and the Acropolis. These are ruins that we now find in Greece. Um, and many Greek cities, just like the ancient um, um, cities of um, sorry, of the other um, Greek and Mycenaean islands were built on these rocky Greek islands with citadels or um, structures on the top of the hills. Now, Greece is no different. When we see the beginnings of Greece, that is um, the Acropolis and the Parthenon were also built um, up on... Um, the tops of these craggy rock islands. So during that time, these were perhaps, you know, we looked at the Bronze Age citadels of Knossos and others. We know that the Mycenaeans declined. It was depopulated. The use of writing in that area declined. Um, the idea of um, political equality is going to slowly... Um, sort of permeate into Greek culture during that period where there was really no organization and the Greek culture had dissipated and culture had become much more pronounced because of, of the emigrations to um, the west coast of the um, Mediterranean. Um, the Greek culture early on had a negative view of what we call hubris or um, pride. They um, took from Homer and the Homeric tradition, the heroic tradition of the gods, if you will, Zeus uh, and the other gods, that it was a negative act to act prideful or um, with arrogance. Um, and... Um, so that is one of the why, because probably they had just experienced being um, defeated. And so they didn't want to act as if they were something they were not. Their, um, their culture, once it had been destroyed, be begins to develop. Trade begins again quite slowly. Uh, the tradition of heroic ideals like um, those parts of what we call the Iliad and the Odyssey. The Odyssey is, of course, um, the story of Homer finding his way home after the wars um, and how long it takes him and the experiences he has. We'll have an opportunity to talk about that a little further. But um, renewed trade, the development of an individual culture, which is going to stress... Um, heroic ideals and um, the idea of aristoi, something called aristoi, which means the best men. Needless to say, that's going to be the root of the word aristocracy. Now we sort of look at an aristocracy um, as pr the privileged few. At that time, they were envious of those people who were, quote unquote, the best men in society. Now, another aspect of the culture, those heroic stories told through the Iliad and the Odyssey, before they were written down, they were sung as part of an oral tradition or like poetry was. They were finally written down in approximately 8,000, I'm sorry, 800 BCE. And of course, this is a tremendous boon to historians because we learn about Greek culture in this way. Um, and, of course, there were a couple other um, characteristics of Greek culture, aside from disliking hubris, uh, looking for the best men, having been uh, poets of some degree. There were also um, the importance of friendship. So if you arrive on another island that you're not part of, it was considered proper etiquette, if you will, to um, embrace the visitor. So this is kind of a culture of guest friendship, let's call it. I believe that's what your book calls it. 
although there was still competition, people were interested in status, they were still interested in protecting their island or their citadel. So there was somewhat of a warrior elite. Um, aristocrats and, um, and the commun commonality um, were common. And they had hero cults, um, etc. So what, what happened with these through that 600 years from 1000 to 4000? Hundred BCE. What we're going to see is the rise of something called the polis. And the polis, um, you will sense, is like polls, where we vote. Polis is like politics. And a polis is just a community. It means a community. Um, and that community, many of these communities, going to experiment with different kinds of government. Um, there are going to be increased um, development of these different poli, if you will, that's plural, of all these poli around these islands. In these islands, there's going to be developed an alphabet. We know that they went from one island to the other, so we know that there was um, trade competition um, using boats. There was seafaring. And because of, of the development of trade and competition and common culture, we see rapid population growth between this period, 1000 and approximately 400 BCE. Um, so a polis, let's call it a city-state. And of course, that is the root, as I said, of the word politics. And it envisions and what it really is is a social collectivity it's not really a state but it's a group or a community in that polis were the following things an agora which is a marketplace um an asti these are probably new words to you but let's think about them an urban community then there was the area outside of the central agora um, and the Asti, the urban area, that was the farmland. That's called a Cora, or the land. Um, and a Sinocosmos is just, you don't have to know that one, that's a coming together, um, really, of like suburbia, a bunch of houses. And then, of course, there was a temple, usually built near the Agora, near the marketplace. And we are going to see something developed called the culture of archaic Greece. Uh, it, archaic Greece, which is old Greece, archaic means sort of old, is going to be in existence from 800 to 500 BCE. And we're going to see, we've already learned a little bit about that culture, guest friendship, hero worship, um, the fear of too much prideful behavior, um, they're going to reestablish writing. Um, they're going to become the largest cultural group within that area. Um, and also um, the Athenians, Athens, uh, are going to pass on the historical narrative of Greece. Um, and so they're Remember, after the Sea People and after the Bronze Age, during this age of the Iron Age, we're going to see now the development, the population growth, and the common culture of all of these Greek islands. Um, they're going to eventually become strong enough to defend themselves against new outsiders. Believe me, that was an incentive after the Sea People. Um, strong enough to trade anywhere on the Mediterranean um, and to establish their cultural dominance. Um, just, I'll, I'll end this brief lecture in the introduction about Greece um, and the dominance and culture of Greece, um, archaic Greece, by telling you that during this period too, those Greeks in those islands are going to tentatively begin to travel outside 
of their little um, group of islands and they're going to expand their colonies and trade with independent colonies, but of course maintain their own polis. What do we call that? We still see that in the world. That's called colonization. When one group of individuals travel outside of their own location, colonize and set up um, sort of satellite systems elsewhere in the area. And they're going to pass on their Greek traits or their cultural traits to these colonies. That is called Pan-Hellenism. Where do we get that? Like Pan uh, means um, all over, all over. They will, as they colonize, Hellenic means Greek, like the Hellenic Society stands for Greek Society, they're going to establish Pan-Hellenic culture. They're going to be Greek hotspots, if you will, all up and down the Mediterranean. Um, and that's called Pan-Hellenism, which really develops um, after the Greeks develop their own culture. They're going to share a language and a culture. They're going to identify with Greece, even though they might be living um, somewhere in southern, what is now southern Italy. They might um, still speak Greek. And of course, in the Middle East, we're going to see a lot of Greek speakers eventually. And um, these colonies, therefore, have a Greek influence, Greek speaking, Greek culture, Greek heritage. So, People, for example, some people in Asia Minor, in Anatolia, even in Turkey, are going to consider themselves more Greek than Turkish. Southern Italy, that's going to be called the Magna Graecia, uh, is going to consider itself more Greek than uh, Italian for many hundreds of years. How come that happened? Trade, competition, um trying to create safe zones, perhaps, so those individuals wouldn't fight them, um, etc. So, next lecture, I will talk about um, other elements of Greek culture, art, the myths, um, and, of course, we'll talk a little bit more about the way these poli, or the polis, is uh, going to emerge uh, as an important city-state or community uh, which is going to pass on their ideals. Thanks.